And we're wrapping it up with Jeff Charlotte, author of C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy. So we only have a couple more minutes, but what else do we need to know about what's going on in the military that we hardly ever hear about? Well, I mean, that, you know, I referred to the, the situation of a lot of women in the military as canary in a coal mine. And I should say, I was given examples of young officers in training, but this goes all the way up. I was talking to senior women commanders who were confronting uh, the same thing. I mean, I remember speaking to one senior officer uh, who was a devout Christian, liked to go to chapel on, uh, on base, and um, the chaplain was lieutenant is preaching every Sunday that her women's job is to uh, support the warriors, that the men are warriors and the women's jobs to support. The women do have a role in the military. They're, you know, they're the folks in the back supporting. And, you know, so she confronted him about this. She's a senior officer and here's your situation. Lieutenant did not back down. You know, you've got to understand sort of military culture. This guy felt perfectly safe, you know, telling a very senior officer who was a woman that um, she could not speak back to him because he's a man. Um, you know, so that problem was pervasive, and I think what that speaks to, I mean, you, on the one hand, you want to say, well, that's tradi traditional military chauvinism and sexism. It's not. That's not traditional in the military. That's new. That's coming from a new kind of place of uh, um, uh, this, this kind of separate but equal idea of women that I think is very attractive to a lot of conservative women. It's the sort of the transformation of feminism that you are empowered. You are empowered to control your domain, which is maternal. Uh, that's not new, that's sort of the 19th century idea, but it's being presented as this kind of revolutionary idea. And when we talk about reproductive rights in this country, you see lots of women embracing this kind of 19th century maternalism, embracing this idea that they're being kind of revolutionary about it, that this is this real deep commitment. And you follow that out. Um, this is not in the new book, but the next book that's coming out is a chapter about a, a youth movement called Battle Cry, um, which they'll have arena events, 3,000 kids, and huge stadium events, 70,000 kids, go on for three days. Um, if you've ever seen the magazine Ad Busters, mm -hmm. the events are like Ad Busters. They're talking about corporate branding. Wouldn't you rather be branded for Christ? That's the answer. You know, they sort of go with this critique of capitalism and see. It's, there's far more, these are girls, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, far more girls get involved than boys, hmm. in my observation, that's anecdotal. Um, but they love this passion, they love this earnestness, and, and, and you know, when I look at that, I think these are people who, they're responding to that critique of society that's being made with fundamentalism that uh, critics of abortion are very effective at making, saying abortion, painting that as a sort of the face of a kind of corporate you know, bland, horrible culture. And these are the people who aren't being spoken to by anyone else. Mm. They will, they, they want they want to be in the fight, they want to be in the fray, and fundamentalism is speaking to them and giving them a cause. Um, you have to go, but uh, what we didn't get to talk about on the radio show was, how do you respond to this? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it's yeah. huge. I, yeah, I, I mean... It, it, you know, these days, it's hard to even join a damn union, yeah. <laughs> let alone respond to this, this, this culture that has been created. And I mean, but what's I think what's so dangerous is, I mean, like, like you said, legislation is being changed, foreign policy is being affected, people are being killed over a lot of this. The tr you have, I hope everybody watching reads Jeff's book because there's so much amazing information in here, and the military chapter just. I mean, it was utterly frightening. Yeah. So how, but where do you even start? I mean, what do you want us to do with your book, I guess, is what I'm asking. What do I do with all of this information? You buy it. That's a good start. <laughs> um, uh, um, you can do a radio show or a podcast. That's a good start, you know. Okay, we're I've gonna done talk, that. We're gonna talk, right, so we're, we're basically recovered. <laughs> we're all done. Um, uh, I do think that, um, uh, you know, there, we, we were going to talk about media, and I don't think we have time to, to get into that. But, right. um, uh, there is a lot of opportunity, you know, with the internet and all this kind of stuff. And I'm mostly disappointed in it because what you see is a kind of a lot of the sort of the hero worship. You see a lot of progressive journalists and leftist journalists. What they like to do is they like to either go to people they really admire, which is good, but they don't. That's all they do. Um, or they go and they do these critiques of the right without bothering to talk to the right. I'm always astonished. I mean, good publications. I'm not going to name names. Um, uh, they, and they'll re reproduce things that 
aren't true. <laughs> uh, you've got to go and engage with the right, not in search of common ground, um, but in search of real information, real understanding. I mean, what are you going to do? You, I mean, if you want to confront fundamentalism, first thing you should probably do is you should find a fundamentalist church in your area, and there is one in your area wherever you are, and you should go, you should be respectful and polite, you're in someone else's you know, house of worship, you should understand that most of the people you meet there are going to be lovely people, and you should not confuse that with what's being preached. A lot of times you get, you see young progressives, they go to a fundamentalist church and they're ready for, you know, uh, just this evil, and they find, you know, really lovely, lovely people, and they say, oh, I guess there's nothing to worry about. Here the issue is not to follow the money, but to follow the ideas. Follow the ideas. You know, it's that old right-wing saying, ideas have consequences. They do. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's what we can do. We can have this more serious engagement with the ideas of the right. Stop dismissing them as stupid. Stop right. dismissing them as, you know, pro mad and everything else. Um, uh, uh, understand that it's a social movement. It's a, people are going to, not like this, but it is an intellectual movement, um, uh, and it does well because so few progressives uh, pay attention, deal with it as it is, rather than as the boogeyman they want to imagine. Mm. It's, it reminds me of Joe Badgent, who writes about yeah. white poor people. Yeah. He says the same thing yeah. that the left hasn't re reached out to white poor people. They've made fun of them. They don't talk about them, and so therefore. They become Tea Partiers, or yeah. they vote Republican. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds—it sounds very similar. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm an admirer of his critique too, and I think—I uh, mean, I don't. The one thing that I think I'm wary of is that kind of false consciousness argument. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at you know uh, poor folks and say they're voting against their own interest, mm -hmm. everyone votes against their own interest. <laughs> um, you know, uh, not everyone. Most people do. Um, nothing wrong with that and who are you to decide what their interests are and you know again follow the ideas if you care about abortion and you vote for some republican you know i was just in lancaster county with joe pitts is part of stupac pitts and you get a lot of very conservative uh mennonites amish people who were mennonites and amish and they vote for pitts because they care about abortion People want to say, but he's, you know, he's terrible, he's on war, you know, and all these other issues that you don't support in, in your Anabaptist tradition. Say, I know. They've made that decision. They, they, they wrestled with that idea. It's not because they don't know. Um, and that's another big part of it. We've got to stop on the left saying, oh, if only those silly people knew better, then they would vote the right way or think the right way. No, no, that's, that's not the case. A lot of them have actually done the work of thinking about where they stand. Some of them, you know, there's some truth in that old labor song, which side are you on? That's where they stand. It's not because they don't know better. They disagree with you. Um, so our, our next step and, and is to not try and emulate the family. It's kind of bland, mushy, bipartisanship and common ground where we erase difference. It's to go out there and, and kind of vigorously same race difference because that sounds sort of like a nice human resources diversity council. Um, uh, but to go for the sharp edges, the sharp edges of democracy is where I think we should go. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for talking with me. Thank Jeff you. Charlotte is author of C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. I'm sorry. I